Okay, so that brings me to our speaker today. Jesse Ostrander received his master's degree from Kansas State University in 2014, and he worked for the Kansas Department of Agriculture's Plant Protection Program as a plant protection specialist slash nursery inspector from 2012 to 13. And we're very fortunate to have Jesse with us. He's at the Plant Diagnostic Laboratory, and he's been in that position since July 2013. So with that, I thank you for being with us and take it away, Jesse. Okay, thank you, Julie, uh, for the introduction and for correctly pronouncing my name. Uh, and I just wanna thank everyone else for their interest in my talk today about common diseases in the garden. Um, when Julie asked me to do this, I, I was told that there'd be a wide range of experience in the audience, ranging from some master gardeners to uh, maybe some garden enthusiasts and possibly even um, some of you might be just starting your interest in gardening. Um, so hopefully some of you might find some of these topics familiar and may recognize some of the diseases that I'll talk about today for yourself. Uh, and then some others of you might, um, this might be your first exposure with some of these things. So the goal of this talk today is just to um, expose everyone uh, to what these diseases look like. All of the things I'm gonna talk about today um, are listed here, and these are all uh, problems that I have received samples of or have helped uh, local um, homeowners with uh, in my time here at the Plant Diagnostic Lab. Um, so hopefully I'm gonna provide you with some level of familiar familiarity and some management options beyond just using fungicides, especially since fungicides don't work <laughs> for any of these problems except those, uh, the blights and anthracnose and septoria. And so my talk today will be focusing on diseases of solanaceous and cucurbit plants as uh, they tend to have the most enthusiasm for those crops. Um, so with that, I'm going to start off talking about blights of tomato and potato. There are two different blights. Uh, one is called early blight and the other is called late blight. Um, early blight it's caused by a fungus. There are two different species. One was named for its uh, characterization on tomato and the other on potato, but both species can affect either crop. And it's a pretty easy to identify disease, probably the easiest one I'm going to talk about today. Um, it produces large, easy to see lesions on the leaves. And as you can see in that picture, they have concentric rings, kind of a bullseye pattern. So that's gonna be something that's fairly easy to recognize. Uh, this pathogen obviously can affect leaves. Um, it's very common. I've been lucky enough not to have this in any tomatoes I've grown, but uh, friends and other people that I've talked with who use community gardens, or if you just grow a large number of tomato plants, I usually only grow about five or so. Um, but if you grow quite a few, it's gonna be very likely that you're gonna get this pathogen. And as its name suggests, it does occur earlier in the growing season. It can also affect stems. And on stems, um, you'll see these sunken cankers, and eventually those cankers will expand to girdle the stem, and the portion of the plant upwards from that infection will die. It can also affect both the tomato fruit and the tubers of potatoes. Um, so you can see some of the damage there on the tomato, on the tuber potato, um, that tissue is just going to turn kind of a dark brown and, uh, and it will die. So with every um, disease I'm going to talk about, I'm also going to provide some management options. And the idea with these management options are uh, they all kind of go back to this theory of the disease triangle. Um, so uh, as plant pathologists, we always look at the disease triangle. The theory here is that the total amount of disease it's going to be based on all the different components of a disease coming together. So to have a disease, you need to have a susceptible host, you need to have a pathogen that can affect that host, and then you need to have environmental condition, conditions conducive to disease. And I'll come back to this when I um, give you some management options here. So how do you manage early blight? Uh, you can manage early blight through sanitation buying quality seed that is free of the pathogen, moving your planting site 
if you have a large number of tomatoes and you're seeing this pathogen year after year, uh, the spores will persist in the environment. So planting your uh, susceptible hosts in a new location will remove them from those infective spores. Also, the uh, next three items are looking at reducing the moisture levels. And then we could also pick hosts that are less susceptible. So if we kind of break these things down, uh, those first three components are looking at reducing the total abundance of the pathogen. Uh, the next three, as I mentioned, are looking at reducing the moisture. So that's um, helping with the environment. The mulching actually does two things. It actually can also reduce the abundance of the pathogen. If you put mulch down, it acts as a barrier between the soil and the plant. So it, it can reduce the amount of um, humidity, but it can also prevent the spores from being splashed up onto the plant. So uh, that could have kind of been put in either category. And then uh, host resistance is going to reduce susceptible hosts. I've also included a list of some varieties that are um, less susceptible to early blight. So if we bring that triangle back in, uh, you can think of if we're reducing the abundance of the pathogen, that's going to make that um, left side of the triangle smaller. And then if we reduce the environment, that's going to make the right side smaller. And then if we reduce the host, it's going to make the, the bottom of the triangle smaller. So we're just going to result in a much smaller triangle, which is going to um, theoretically reduce the total amount of disease. It's a pretty good theory, though, because it does work. Uh, some other things that you can do would, of course, be uh, chemical control. So there are some, um, there are actually a lot of fungicides available for this pathogen, but few are available if you do not have a pesticide applicator's license. So the ones that I've listed here are all products that I found on Home Depot's website that were listed for control of uh, early blight. Um, the one that I would personally use would be chlorothalonil. And... The product name is on the right-hand side there. So first we have the fungicide AI. That's the, art of, or the active ingredient, not, art, not artificial intelligence. Um, so the active ingredient is chlorothalonil. Um, if you apply chlorothalonil, it's going to protect your plant for up to 14 days. And then a uh, product name would include daconil or funginil. And these are usually in little spray bottles. Um, Mancozeb and Maneb or other uh, fungicides that you can find, those target um, the membrane of the fungus. And uh, the other two um, listed on there, um, you can also find. So the bacillus is, uh, if you're wanting to be organic, that's um, something that's uh, a, a natural, it's a bacteria that is um, antagonistic to the fungus. So that's um, it for early blight. Um, late blight is the other blight uh, that can affect tomatoes and potatoes. It's caused by a fungal-like organism, so it's not actually a fungus. Phytophthora infestans is its name. It's not quite as easy to identify. It doesn't have that nice, characteristic, obvious bullseye pattern lesion. Uh, in the photo that I provided here, um, you can see there's just kind of a diffuse browning on the stems. Uh, eventually it will kill the plant, but at first you'll just see a diffuse browning. And if the humidity is high enough, as it was in this photo, um, those infected areas are getting a fuzzy appearance because the fungus, or well, the fungal-like organism is producing uh, infective spores. This pathogen is historically significant. Um, it was the cause of the Irish potato famine in the mid-1800s, and it can be immensely destructive. And as its name indicates, it does usually occur later in the summer, although it does like cool, wet uh, periods as well. And so it can affect the leaves, the stems, as well as the fruits of tomato and potato. It can also infect hairy nightshade, uh, a weed, so it can overwinter on hairy nightshade. Here's just another image of it infecting a stem. And here are some tomatoes and tubers that are infected. Um, <laughs> they look pretty bad. You obviously wouldn't want to eat those tomatoes at that point. And if you cut open the potato, there's quite a few pathogens that can uh, create necrosis in potato tubers, but 
Late Blight has a very granular-like appearance, almost looks sandy. And this photo doesn't maybe do it justice, but also has a salmon color to it. Looks a little bit more orange in this photo. I like this photo because you can see the granular um, texture of the infected tissue. So where does this pathogen come from? Uh, it actually doesn't like to overwinter well this far north. It is an obligate parasite, so it needs a living host to survive. And so the combination of how cold it gets here and how long the winter is, uh, usually there's no starting inoculum out in your garden, but it does get spread with tuber seed pieces. Um, you could also purchase an, a uh, tomato or a potato uh, transplant grown in a greenhouse in another area and introduce that into your garden for the season. And to a lesser degree, spores are able to travel uh, north from southern states. Um, these fungal-like organisms are more uh, reliant on water to move as opposed to wind, so they don't travel quite as readily, but uh, they can move through the environment. So what will you do to manage if you see this pathogen? Uh, you're going to want to destroy any residue by burying it or removing it from the area or burning it. Whenever you bury a pathogen, it is introduced into the soil. And if you have healthy soil, there's going to be a lot of organisms that are antagonistic to it, so it breaks down faster. If you do have a plant with this pathogen, you're going to, you're going to want to immediately remove it from your garden to prevent it from spreading to other plants. And then controlling any uh, volunteer plants, uh, probably less of an issue here. That would definitely be helpful in a southern state where plants could potentially uh, grow 12 months of the year. Uh, that's obviously not the case in North Dakota. Uh, and then also controlling those weedy hosts. Again, those are more southern um, control recommendations for more southern areas. Also, if you like to save your own seed, if you've had this pathogen, you're definitely going to want to think twice about that. Um, so try and use um, certified commercial seed. Uh, if you do save your seed, you could wash or heat treat it, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, and then just inspect transplants at garden centers for any signs of infection. So I showed you some stem lesions on the leaves. You'll see this kind of diffuse browning. It often starts at the margin of the leaf, and it'll cause the leaf to constrict. So we have leaves with varying uh, degrees of infection here, and you can even see it traveling down the stem from some of the infected leaves. Um, and you won't necessarily see the fuzzy-like appearance unless the humidity is very high. What can you do to manage it? So there is another, um, well, I've already given you some, um, some tips there on that earlier page, but some additional management tips would include host resistance again. So there's quite a few. Um, these are tomato varieties. I didn't give a list of potato. Also for chemical control, chemical control is going to be a little bit different. Um, the chlorothalonil will work for late blight as well, but it will not. Uh, the maneb and um, mancozeb will not because they target the fungal um, the cell membrane, and the cell membranes are different on this pathogen. So if you're ever wanting to um, see an inclusive list of chemical control options, uh, Purdue releases a really good um, resource called the Midwest Vegetable Guide. And I provided a link there. And so you can find um, your crop and then it'll have a list of different pathogens and available fungicides. And they release, they update that every year. And so that way you'll see the, uh, the most uh, up-to-date recommendations for those fungicides because resistance does develop or the EPA might uh, limit uh, what can be sprayed on different food products um, year to year. So it's important that you reference something that's kept up to date. So um, another fungal pathogen of tomato and potato would be anthracnose. It's caused by the fungus Coleotrachum cocodes and other species of Coleotrachum. Uh, it can also cause black dot on potato. And um, while all of the Coleotrachum species have a wide host range, so up to 68 different weedy hosts can serve as um, alternative hosts. Um, only Colototricum cocodes can persist in the soil in these structures called microsclerotia. And so this pathogen can be quite destructive. Um, it primarily affects ripening fruit. Uh, it can affect tubers though, producing a black dot disease. 
And what's difficult with this pathogen is that the fruit could be infected very early season. The fungus will, the spores will land on the uh, not yet developed tomato and they can just barely penetrate the uh, epidermis and then they'll just kind of hang out and wait until the, uh, the tomato is well ripe. So that can make fungicidal control difficult because your tomatoes could be infected, but you won't see any evidence of this. So should you be spraying all, all season in anticipation of having an anthracnose problem, or should you wait? And at that point, it's too late. Um, I would recommend if you've never seen this in your garden, not to spray fungicides. And if you have seen it before, then you can uh, make your own decisions for that. Because if you do harvest the fruit regularly and consume it, in a timely manner, um, this won't be a huge problem for you. But if you have a lot of tomatoes that maybe you store for a few weeks after harvest or sometime, uh, this can lead to storage rots quite rapidly. So the symptoms that you're going to see is uh, once the fungus becomes active on that ripened fruit, you're just going to get a collapse of tissue under the epidermis. Eventually, the epidermis will split and it'll really take off. You'll see a lot of uh, black um, mycelial structures and then over time the fungus will start producing um, some spores and those spores are kind of a salmon color as well. Um, and then on potato, the black dot pathogen, it's named black dot because you can see little black dot like fruiting structures, um, but the actual tuber symptoms are a more diffuse, uh, almost like a bruising and then a collapse of the tissue. So what can you do for this? Well, it's soil borne, so moving your plants to a new location is key to management if you've had this uh, problem for several years. And mulching will also help with this since those um, structures are surviving in the soil. Um, avoiding overhead irrigation will help the plants dry out. Um, so that's pretty much a common theme here, the overhead irrigation. You want your plants to uh, stay as dry as possible. It's going to help with basically every disease that I'm going to talk about today. Um, controlling weeds is going to be really important with anthracnose just because there are so many different species that it can uh, survive on. Uh, removing the fruit regularly is going to prevent uh, any overripe fruit from producing spores and reintroducing those into the environment. And as I kind of alluded to earlier, fungicides can be effective, but you're gonna really have to apply those periodically because fungicides are, and I meant to mention this earlier, you, we really only wanna use fungicides to prevent infection. We don't ever use them to cure. So you need to get those fungicides on there before the uh, fruit is in, infected and that can be hard to do um, since you won't see any signs of this maybe developing until later in the season. Um, for host resistance, slower to ripen cultivars are somewhat resistant just because um, it gives you more time to get them out of the garden and use them. And um, when those do become infected, they produce smaller lesions and they develop uh, slower. And so there's less spores that are gonna be introduced into the environment. Um, the last fungal pathogen I'm going to talk about is Septoria, um, and that can be very destructive to foliage. It doesn't usually affect the fruit directly, but if your plant's losing a lot of its leaves, it's not going to have any tissue to produce photosynthates, and so that's going to re result in fewer fruits, lower quality fruits. Um, and so this can affect all vegetative parts of the plant. And we can see a leaf there that has a pretty severe um, amount of damage from septoria. Uh, you want to look and see what the uh, lesions are going to look like um, earlier in the season. They're pretty small and they're characterized by having a gray center with a dark border. And if you have good eyesight, you'll be able to see these little black fruiting bodies in the middle of the lesions. Um, if you need any assistance, you can always see those very clearly with a hand lens. The lower leaves are usually affected first because again, this pathogen is gonna be in the soil. So it's gonna affect the lower parts of the plant that maybe come into contact with the soil or let um, rain water splash up. And the lesions are usually pretty small, one to three millimeters in size. As I mentioned, they have that dark margin with a tan gray center and uh, they could have uh, fruiting bodies visible. 
So I just told you that the lesions are small and I'm showing you these huge lesions, but um, uh, these are uncharacteristically large. Um, sometimes you see things that aren't perfectly textbook, just depending on uh, different environmental factors and host pathogen interactions. Um, I liked this photo because you can very clearly see the little black fruiting bodies in the middle of the, um, the, the lesions, the infection centers. And if we look at those really close, when it's nice and humid out, um, you'll see the spores being released in these mucosal uh, matrix coming out of the um, structures called pycnidia. So as I already mentioned, um, the pathogen will spread upwards and heavily infected leaves will turn yellow and then eventually they could turn brown and fall from the plant. And that, I'm talking about the whole leaf, so not just where the infections are. As the leaf becomes more heavily infected, the whole leaf might turn yellow and then brown and then be cast from the plant. So the primary inoculum, um, Again, it can be seed borne on the coat of infected seeds. Uh, could just be in old plant debris. Uh, can um, survive on some solanaceous weeds. And then it's been, um, it's been shown through experiments that just random equipment out in the environment, such as pots, plant stakes, other gardening equipment can be a reservoir for spores. And then once it's in the environment, it's just spread there from rainfall, wind, um, but especially if you or um, a pet or even insects are moving through the foliage of the tomato plant when it's wet, that's really going to um, spread any infections that you have throughout your uh, crop. So what can you do if you see this? Well, there is no host resistance available for this pathogen, um, but you can move the plants to a new location again. I know that's a luxury many people might not be able to afford, but if possible, um, moving your plants to new locations periodically is um, a just great all around um, decision for you to grow in your garden. Um, even moving them for just one year can help with managing this pathogen, uh, but two years is recommended. Um, you can also control those alternate hosts or just clean everything up, clean your pots, clean your plant stakes, clean your tools, um, and there are fungicides available as well. So chlorothalonil, again, uh, is a really great um, tool. Uh, I did mean to talk a little bit more about chlorothalonil when I first introduced it. So chlorothalonil is a really broad spectrum fungicide, um, and it also works on fungal-like organisms. Uh, it's pretty toxic, but it has a short, um, short lifespan out in the environment. It breaks down pretty quick. Part of what makes it toxic is it's highly reactive, so it reacts and breaks down pretty fast. Um, if you do treat anything with this, you want to clean it very thoroughly if any produce gets chlorothalonil on it. Also, when you're uh, treating plants with chlorothalonil, again, I already mentioned this, but you want to treat the whole plant, not just what's infected. Um, and you also want to get the underside of the leaves as well, because this product does not go into the plant. It would actually kill the plant if it was absorbed into the plant. Um, it's formulated to remain outside of the plant and coat it. So only the areas that are coated with it are going to be protected. So you'll want to spray the underside and the top of all parts of the plants. So that's all I'm going to mention for fungal diseases. Um, and in general, whenever you're trying to manage those diseases, it's really best if you try and do those non-chemical controls and if you can achieve control with those, awesome. If you can't, then it might be a good idea to uh, start thinking about using some fungicide. Um, now I'm going to talk about bacterial diseases of tomatoes. I'm going to talk about what all three of them look like, and then I'll give management, um, general management for all of them together. Um, there's three different bacterial diseases. Bacterial canker is pretty rare. It's so destructive that there is a lot of uh, mandatory testing that goes on to make sure that that's not being introduced or spread around through seeds and transplants. And then bacterial speck and spot um, do occur more frequently, but they're less damaging. Um, the symptoms of bacterial canker will depend on the age of the plant. So if the plant was 
or well, the depend that on the age of the plant when it was infected. So early season infection, um, systemic infection from seed or infected transplants. Um, systemically infected seeds might just die. They might just show poor germination. If they do happen to um, become established, they'll show blistering on the petiole and browning of the mid vein, but they could remain asymptomatic, which is why this pathogen is tested for uh, regularly to prevent it from spreading since visual inspection alone is not sufficient. So here we can see actually um, six transplants and uh, the middle one in the top, especially its topmost leaf there in the middle, is showing a little bit of uh, off color and curling. Um, and that's actually all the symptoms that you might see for a, um, a infected plant. Um, if the plant does end up getting planted and uh, developing um, later in the season, you may see some interesting symptoms such as one half of a leaf or half of a stem will die. Um, this is a clavibacter bacterium and it moves through the vascular tissues, so the water and sugar conductive tissue. And because of that, um, it might only move up through the vascular tissue on that side of the stem. So that's why you're seeing that somewhat crazy looking symptom, but it makes sense when you think of the plant as a series of pipes or tubes. Um, if you do cut into that stem, you will see that the interior stem tissues have brown vascular tissue. And um, the stems may develop a canker and split open, and the whole plant will wilt. And as I mentioned, this pathogen is very severe. Uh, it only takes one out of 10,000 plants to be infected to create a serious ec epidemic. So here's a photo showing um, one of the, a, an infected plant stem that's been cut into, and we can see the browning and death of those vascular tissues. On the fruit, you'll just see small white spots. Um, I think we can all notice them here, but they're gonna be much more noticeable as the fruit ripens and you see the contrast. Uh, they're just little white blisters. So moving on to bacterial spec, um, these are small, round, smooth lesions that occur on the leaves. And each lesion can be seen on both sides of the leaf. So they just kind of cause all the tissue, different tissue levels to collapse in. And they will generally have a chlorotic halo. Um, and many lesions will cause the entire leaf to turn yellow. Uh, on the fruit, the lesions are smaller than they are on the leaves. And if they are uh, produced early in the season, uh, the lesions will become sunken in as the rest of the fruit continues to expand, but those areas with the lesions um, just kind of stay. And this could be confused with septoria because the lesion size are somewhat similar and the way that a heavily infected leaf will show just overall chlorosis and can be cast from the plant. Um, one thing that you might notice if you have a good eye and looking at this is that uh, I think actually that leaf might have a few septoria lesions there in the middle towards the um, leaf tip, but overall most of those bacterial spec lesions are just totally dark, whereas the septoria lesions have that color difference, the light gray center with the, um, the dark border. And also you will not see any of the little black fruiting bodies on bacterial spec. So those are some things you can look at, and it's important to be able to tell the difference because if you have septoria, a fungicide will help. If you have bacterial spec, it will not. And here we can just see some of those um, specs, those infected areas on a uh, fruit. It's important to mention that none of these bacterial pathogens are going to harm us if we were to eat that fruit. Um, they, for the most part, especially with bacterial spec, they just cause that fruit not to look as good. Um, sometimes if these are grown commercially, they can still use the fruits for um, some production, such as making them into ketchup or something along those lines. Um, but at a fresh produce, um, you know, supermarkets produce section, that would not be high enough quality to be sold in that setting. So the third one here is bacterial spot. Uh, as the name might suggest, the infection, the lesions are gonna be larger. They're more distinct um, on vegetative tissue. Uh, later season, the leaves might just have a generally scorched appearance. And it could be confused with other fungal pathogens when first forming, especially early blight. It has a similar 
um, infection lesion in size and somewhat shape um, to bacterial spot. The chlorosis will eventually become extremely diffuse, um, even compared to bacterial spec, just well, you'll see in a moment when I uh, show you an infected plant in the next slide. So um, with this disease, there are actually four different species of Xanthomonas that can infect tomato and create bacterial spot. And one of the four species will create a shot hole-like appearance. So instead of seeing the lesions, uh, you'll just see a missing area where the uh, infected tissue has fallen out of the plant. So that might be something to keep in the back of your uh, mind if you're growing and you see shot hole in your tomato plants. Uh, mature lesions on the fruit are scab-like. So you can see this causes quite a bit of damage to the um, foliar tissue of the plant. And on the uh, fruit, those lesions are kind of corky and scab-like when they are mature. So what can you do for these diseases? Um, well, it's a good idea to confirm them. Um, they're pretty easy to confirm with some microscopy um, or culturing. So um, fungicides won't help though. So it's best to know which pathogen you have so you can avoid using an ineffective product. Um, also, buying only clean certified seed, that's more important. I mean, it's important with all these pathogens, but especially with bacteria, um, they tend to be seed transmitted. So seeds sold from a professional supplier should have been tested free from both the um, clavibacter that causes the bacterial canker and the xanthomonas species that cause uh, bacterial um, spot and they should have been washed or heat treated to remove other bacterial pathogens. If you do want to save your own seed, you can always um, either wash it with a, a bleach solution or you can put it in um, 120 to 125 degree water for 25 minutes for tomatoes. Um, of course, um, at any first signs of this patch and immediately stop any overhead watering, that's gonna spread it like crazy. Um, so you definitely don't want to be um, using uh, overhead irrigation system. Removing any heavily infected plants or even parts on a plant will prevent bacteria, will ooze out of the infected areas of the plant so that it can be washed off and find new tissue to infect. Also only handle plants when they're dry uh, if you have any bacterial um, diseases. And you should also be cleaning tools or your hands between plants. So I'm not saying you need to be out there constantly washing your hands and your tools if your plants look healthy, just if you have um, some of these pathogens. And then removing all debris at the end of the season is gonna prevent um, a source of inoculum for the next year. And so that works for all bacterial diseases of tomato. So that's, um, that pretty much sums up the pathogen specifics to the solanaceous crops. Um, now I'm going to talk about a couple of pathogens that affect, well, really I'm going to talk about bacterial wilt of cucurbits, and then I'm going to talk about um, viruses that can affect both cucurbits and solanaceous. So bacterial wilt of cucurbits, um, I think I've only seen this twice, but does occur here, uh, and it's caused by yet a fourth type of bacterium, Erwinia species. Um, the Erwinia cannot actually survive in the environment, but it does overwinter in the cucumber beetle's gut, and then it's spread by their feeding um, activity out in the field. Um, cucumbers and muskmelons are the most susceptible to this, so it usually will kill them if introduced. Pumpkins and squash are less affected. They will show some symptoms, but they might not um, die, or at least not with the same amount of um, their winia being introduced to them. And watermelons are not affected. So that's good news. Although I don't think there's too many people growing watermelons. Oh, sorry, I hit the back button there. Um, I know watermelons are a bit difficult to grow this far north, but if you do decide to grow watermelon, they won't be affected by this pathogen. Uh, so what are the symptoms you're going to see? Well, the leaves will just start to dull. They'll get kind of an off 
color a darker green to gray. And then the plant will start to wilt during the day, but it will still recover overnight. So what's happening is that bacteria is clogging up the water um, conductive tissue. Uh, so the plant um, can recover during the cool night, but it will wilt during the day even if you water it. Eventually, that tissue will become plugged up to the point that even with the night period to recover, the plant will still um, will not recover. And it will have a scorched appearance to the leaves, and then eventually the leaves will die, and then the whole plant can wilt and die. Uh, depending on how the beetles are feeding, where they're feeding on the plant. Uh, it might only affect a single runner or some runners of the vine, or it could affect the entire plant. So we can see just the um, total wilting of the plant there um, with the uh, runner in the background is still healthy. Other thing you're gonna do to Confirm if you have this pathogen, you can look for those cucumber beetles. You can look for their feeding injury on the leaves, shown there on the right, or the beetle themselves. Um, I already showed both the beetles, but there is a 12 spotted beetle as well as a striped beetle. You can also look on the underside of the leaves for their eggs. Um, and if you have any questions about confirming if you have cucumber beetle, um, we do have an entomologist here in the lab that would be happy to help you out if you wanted to send in a sample or send in a photo to the plant diagnostic lab. And then the uh, confirmation of the disease though would actually be the bacteria in the tissue of the plant. Um, it isn't impossible to have cucumber beetles and not have, or yeah, you could have cucumber beetles and not have them introduce their Winnia bacteria. Uh, most of the time though they are introducing that, um, but if you cut into the stem and kind of pull the plant away, touch the cut pieces and pull them away, uh, you'll see this gummy um, strands formed by the bacteria. Uh, they produce sugars and that's actually what clogs up the, the vascular tissue is those sugars make it sticky and they stick inside of the, the plant. So really you're going to want to control the insects though. You can't do anything for that plant. It's, it's goner if it's infected. Um, the, depending on the size of your operation, you could just pick the insects off. Um, there are insecticides available, but they do harm pollinators. Um, and of course, we're always going to protect our pollinators and we're all made very aware of the dangerous pollinators um, these days. Uh, if you do decide to use insecticides, um, there's seven in permethrin based that are toxic to bees, but if you do uh, later day applications uh, when the bees aren't active, that will help it uh, get absorbed into those plants and not be in the environment to harm the bees. You could also use um, other plants to pull them off of your uh, cucumbers and melons, um, but personally I'd prefer to have the zucchini, so I don't know if I would go that route, but um, that's an option <laughs> for you. Uh, and then of course you're going to remove any plants showing signs of infection. Um, so if you see any day wilting in spite of watering and then it recovers at night, um, go ahead and remove that plant as best. And again, just don't use a fungicide for this pathogen. Um, that's not going to be effective at managing either the beetle or the bacterium. So we talked about some fungal pathogens and some bacteria. Um, the last group here are viruses. Um, so solanaceous and cucurbit plants can get many of the same viruses. Some common ones that uh, are well documented are um, tobacco mosaic virus, tomato spotted wilt virus, cucumber mosaic virus. Um, potatoes also, if you get potatoes from seed, obviously you're not going to have a chance to see their foliage before you plant them. Um, they have, there's a high level of incidence of potato leaf roll and potato virus Y um, in potato plants and those are spread by vegetative propagation. Um, I'm just gonna kind of treat viruses as a group here. I'm not gonna go through each one. As you've probably noticed, we don't have a ton of time left to do that. Um, so what are you gonna see if you have a virus? Well, chlorosis is a common sign of viruses. When we talk about tobacco mosaic, cucumber mosaic, we're talking about the mosaic pattern of the chlorosis and the healthy green tissue. Um, so sometimes it can be maybe a little difficult to to tell a viral infection apart from a nutrient deficiency. Um, one way to tell is with nutrients, usually 
depending on if the nutrient's mobile or immobile, the older leaves are gonna look more affected, the new leaves will look healthier or vice versa. A virus will be more sporadic throughout the plant. Also with uh, nutrient uh, disorders, usually the veins will remain green and the intervenal ish tissue will be yellow or vice versa. Whereas you can see um, how random like the chlorosis is, that's actually a picture of a cucurbit with cucumber mosaic virus. So it's not gonna follow those patterns of the, um, of the nutrient deficiency. Um, leaf distortion can also occur. And to some degree that could be confused with chemical herbicide spray damage. So ask yourself, you know, what makes sense if you're in a heavily urban area and you have a small yard with a fence up and you haven't applied any herbicide, chances are you're not getting any drift, right? But if you're out in a more rural area where spray activity is going on, it might be more difficult to determine on your own if it's a herbicide or a viral infection. So here's a tomato plant and it also has cucumber mosaic virus and it looks a little bit different than that cucurbit that we showed. So uh, plant viruses are typically named for the host that they are first discovered on and the symptoms that they produced on that host. Um, different hosts or even different cultivars or even different varieties of that host as well as other variables such as how long has the plant been infected um, what other stress factors does that plant have in the environment? Is it healthy in spite of, besides that virus, is it healthy or is it also experiencing a nutrient deficiency or drought stress? Those are going to make it look a little different. So that's why it can be somewhat difficult to determine if you have a virus or not. It's pretty easy if you see cucumber mosaic virus in a healthy susceptible cucumber plant, but it can be more difficult in some of the many other hosts that are susceptible. Uh, and then some viruses will also include necrosis. So um, here we have a tomato leaf with um, tomato spotted wilt virus. And that's a very severe virus that will result in the whole death of the plant eventually. Um, but at first you'll see spots and the plant will start to wilt. And then over time, the, the leaves usually first will turn uh, necrotic and then the plant will just lose all of its leaves and the stems will wither up and die. And of course, how fast it does that is going to depend on how healthy is the plant otherwise. You know, if you're watering it, if you're reducing all of those stress factors, it might withstand that virus for a very long time, maybe even the rest of the season. But if uh, there's other stress factors involved, uh, that plant's going to succumb to that virus much quicker. So overall, plants with viruses are just going to be unthrifty. They're going to probably be stunted, grow slower. They're going to fail to perform. Uh, they might still produce some fruit, but it might be smaller um, and it can be hard to identify a virus because as I already mentioned there's so many different factors that can contribute to how that virus is um, is being presented on that plant what are the symptoms on that plant so it is a really good idea to get confirmation of a virus um, some viruses are spread by insect vectors others can be seed borne uh, so confirmation is going to help identify the origin of the virus and provide you with specific management tools. Um, and the Plant Diagnostic Lab is able to identify a lot of the common viruses that are um, found in the landscape in North Dakota. Uh, any produce produced on these plants will still be safe to eat, but they might not taste very good uh, since the plant was sick. So here's just a nice image of cucumbers that have varying degrees of severity of cucumber mosaic virus. So none of these viruses are going to infect us. Our immune system is pretty amazing compared to a plant, uh, and these viruses aren't going to do anything to you. Um, nor do they have the correct receptor proteins for you. But, um, but you still might not want to eat the produce just because you might want to spend your time eating something that tastes a bit better. <laughs> So that's really um, it for the different pathogens we're going to talk about. Um, perhaps you think that was more than enough. Um, as I had mentioned, my goal here was just to kind of expose everyone to the different pathogens. We didn't go too in depth into any specific one. I do want to wrap up the talk. Um, it looks like I have a few minutes left uh, just to talk about some abiotic disorders that might look similar to some of the things we talked about today. So herbicide damage, as I mentioned, can also cause um, leaf distortion. 
And uh, solanaceous plants are extremely sensitive to herbicides. Um, potatoes, especially, you know, you could get a very low level of uh, dicamba or other growth regulator that could hit your garden. All the other plants will look fine and your potatoes will look absolutely crazy. Um, tomatoes are the next most sensitive <laughs> in general, uh, but they're quite a bit less sensitive than potatoes. And the source of the herbicide could be from several different things. Um, if you do manure amendments, there are some um, growth regulator herbicides they apply to forage, uh, selective for dicots uh, that cattle will eat and it will remain stable through their gut and persist in the manure and can be introduced to your garden that way. And depending on the rates, uh, it might be low enough that no other plants are affected, but your potatoes, again, kind of go crazy. So here's some examples of that with the leaf curling and the puckering. And so potato plants with um, PVY, leaf roll, um, and potentially even cucumber mosaic could also have some uh, leaf distortion. So just something to keep in mind. And then um, if you've ever grown tomatoes, I'd be very surprised if you're not aware of blossom end rot. But I just wanted to kind of go full circle here and remind you that uh, there are other things that can cause rots of your tomatoes. And even though in these photos we show it coming from the uh, petiole down, um, you can get infections on other parts of the tomato. So uh, you might not necessarily want to assume that your problem is just blossom and rot. Um, but of course, if you're doing container gardening, um, blossom and rot's exacerbated by not just a lack of calcium, but also if the plants experience um, very dry and then wet and then dry alternating um, conditions. It just makes the uh, plant unable to utilize calcium even if it's present and will reduce result in that blossom and rot, the collapse of those tissues uh, because they don't have enough calcium for their cell wall. Um, so with that, holy cow, I, I ended on the minute. I'm quite proud of myself. So, That's great. Um, <laughs> So with that, if anyone has any questions, I might have answers. All right. Well, we have five questions that have popped up. Oh, okay. I can try to, should I look at those now? I'll, I'll just say them out loud and they're also in the chat. So okay. Becky asks, does crop rotation count as moving plants to minimize pathogens? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, that's the whole idea with crop rotation on larger scale um, agronomics and then you can do that on a smaller scale in your garden. Um, I would say the one thing to think about is if you if you have your plants kind of organized into different blocks and the block is sharing a border with where they were the previous season that's probably not sufficient. You want to actually have some you know some space there what the exact minimum, you know, number of feet or whatever that you need to um, space them apart. I don't have a, a specific number there, but the more the better. All right, thank you. Um, I posted a comment myself. This is Julie. We have some resources from other states for you available on the Field to Fork site and also a certificate. So that's just a reminder that you can click back to Field to Fork and you'll be able to pull open some other resources. So Judy asks, if a plant is asymptomatic of bacterial infection, how do you detect the bacteria? Well, you probably wouldn't, but um, there are PCR tests. So um, through the USDA, and sometimes they'll partner with labs that will have to adopt their protocol, but they'll just randomly select um, plants in a greenhouse bay, for example, and or the seed of those plants um, and test them for the presence of the DNA of that bacteria. Um, I do similar testing on potatoes for bacterial diseases, so I can't give you the exact details, but um, yeah, basically they do um, diagnostic monitoring to prevent it from being spread. All right, so here's your next question. You mentioned heat treatment in water at a certain temperature. How about dry heat or how does that affect seed viability? Um, I would presume that dry heat would not be preferred to wet um, for potentially a number of reasons. 
I think the wet is probably gonna be more effective because rather than air, you know, you have a more solid substance coming into contact with that bacteria, so it's gonna always be more effective. Um, I've not really read anything either way about dry heat. I've only ever heard of people using the, the wet heat. All right. Here's another question. Do pathogens arise if seeds are stored and used in future years? I'm sorry, you got really quiet towards the end of that question. Oh, okay, let me try it again. Do pathogens arise if seeds are stored and used in future years? Well, the pathogen is either going to be there when the seed was collected or it's not. So um, it could remain on that seed even if you hold it for more than one year, yes. But it's not gonna spontaneously arise on that seed. It was either on that seed when you collected it or it wasn't. All right. And from Lucinda, for blossom rot, does adding eggshells to soil help or what else can we do? Um, the biggest thing you can do is try to keep your tomatoes appropriately watered. Um, Eggshells can help. The problem with organic amendments like that is just that they take time to break down. So um, a non-organic form of calcium that's immediately bioavailable is gonna more quickly and readily. But if you're adding eggshells every year as a form of maintenance, that can certainly be effective. Um, so it's kind of the, the two-step combo. Um, but even if you add calcium, you're still going to see blossom and rot if you allow the plant to become water stressed. And another question just popped up. You're doing great, Jesse. <laughs> <laughs> Does cool storage of seeds affect pathogen viability? Uh, no. The, the pathogens are able to survive out in the landscape through winters, so they're going to be fine if you cool down the seed. Um, again, if the only one we talked about today um, was Phytophthora uh, infestans, and uh, it, would, um, it would not survive at colder temperatures, but it's, it's not seed disseminated anyways. It needs a living host, so. Okay, does anyone else have any questions you wanna type in? We have a few minutes left. I was interested in your comment that the plant diseases that some of the ones you were showing us do not affect us. What is your, what's your thought on cutting off those diseased parts of fruits of the plant? And like eating the rest of it? Eating the rest of it. <laughs> well, that's what I do. Um, <laughs> well, I would say, so some fungi can... I don't really want to get in this too deep, but there are some allergic reactions to different things, um, especially with fungi. You know, when we hear about like home molds and things, they affect people differently. Same could be said of anything on your produce. So um, there's not zero risk there that something could be produced that someone would have a reaction to. Um, personally, if it's heavily fungal rot, I throw it away. But if it's a small spot, like you're just seeing that first photo of um, anthracnose where you get that kind of localized water soaking, but you're not seeing any of that black growth or that the, the uh, skin hasn't cracked open, I cut those parts off and eat them. And so. in, in the world of food preservation, we usually say preserve the best and eat the rest. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that brings us to the end. And I really want to thank you, Jesse, for doing this. And maybe we can do it again. <laughs> okay. Well, actually, it was pretty fun. So thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to do it. And thanks, everyone, for being here. We have three more of these Wednesday webinars left in our series. So join us next week for Pollinator Gardens.